Excerpt from Book Six of The Principles of Moral and Political Philosophy by William Paley, published in 1785. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Book Six Elements of Political Knowledge, Chapter Two how subjection to civil government is maintained could we view our own species from a distance or regard mankind with the same sort of observation with which we read the natural history or remark the manners of any other animal there is nothing in the human character which would more surprise us than the almost universal subjugation of strength to weakness than to see many millions of robust men in the complete use and exercise of their personal faculties and without any defect of courage waiting upon the will of a child a woman a driveller or a lunatic and although when we suppose a vast empire in absolute subjection to one person and that one depressed beneath the level of his species by infirmities or vice we suppose perhaps an extreme case yet in all cases even in the most popular forms of civil government the physical strength resides in the governed in what manner opinion thus prevails over strength or how power which naturally belongs to superior force is maintained in opposition to it in other words by what motives the many are induced to submit to the few becomes an inquiry which lies at the root of almost every political speculation it removes indeed but does not resolve the difficulty to say that civil governments are nowadays almost universally upholden by standing armies for the question still returns how are these armies themselves kept in subjection or made to obey the commands and carry on the designs of the prince or state which employs them now although we should look in vain for any single reason which will account for the general submission of mankind to civil government yet it may not be difficult to assign for every class and character in the community considerations powerful enough to dissuade each from any attempt to resist established authority every man has his motive though not the same in this as in other instances the conduct is similar but the principles which produce it extremely various there are three distinctions of character into which the subjects of a state may be divided into those who obey from prejudice those who obey from reason and those who obey from self-interest one they who obey from prejudice are determined by an opinion of right in their governors which opinion is founded upon prescription in monarchies and aristocracies which are hereditary the prescription operates in favor of particular families in republics and elected offices in favor of particular forms of government or constitutions nor is it to be wondered at that mankind should reverence authority founded in prescription when they observe that it is prescription which confers the title to almost everything else the whole course and all the habits of civil life favor this prejudice upon what other foundation stands any man's right to his estate the right of primogeniture the succession of kindred the descent of property the inheritance of honors the demand of tithes tolls rents or services from the estates of others the right of way the powers of office and magistracy, the privileges of nobility the immunities of the clergy upon what are they all founded in the apprehension at least of the multitude but upon prescription to what else when the claims are contested is the appeal made it is natural to transfer the same principle to the affairs of government and to regard those exertions of power which have been long exercised and acquiesced in as so many rights in the sovereign 
and to consider obedience to his commands within certain accustomed limits as enjoined by that rule of conscience which requires us to render every man his due in hereditary monarchies the prescriptive title is corroborated and its influence considerably augmented by an ascension of religious sentiments and by that sacredness which men are wont to ascribe to the persons of princes princes themselves have not failed to take advantage of this disposition by claiming a superior dignity as it were of nature or a peculiar delegation from the supreme being for this purpose were introduced the titles of sacred majesty of god's anointed representative vice-regent together with the ceremonies of investitures and coronations which are calculated not so much to recognize the authority of sovereigns as to consecrate their persons where a fabulous religion permitted it the public veneration has been challenged by bolder pretensions the roman emperors usurped the titles and arrogated the worship of gods the mythology of the heroic ages and of many barbarous nations was easily converted to this purpose some princes like the heroes of homer and the founder of the roman name derived their birth from the gods others with numa pretended a secret communication with some divine being and others again like the incas of peru and the ancient saxon kings extracted their descent from the deities of their country the lama of tibet at this day is held forth to his subjects not as the offspring or successor of a divine race of princes but as the immortal god himself the object at once of civil obedience and religious adoration this instance is singular and may be accounted the farthest point to which the abuse of human credulity has ever been carried but in all these instances the purpose was the same to engage the reverence of mankind by an application to their religious principles the reader will be careful to observe that in this article we denominate every opinion whether true or false a prejudice which is not founded upon argument in the mind of the person who entertains it two they who obey from reason that is to say from conscience as instructed by reasonings and conclusions of their own are determined by the consideration of the necessity of some government or other the chief mischief of civil commotions and the danger of resettling the government of their country better or at all if once subverted or disturbed three they who obey from self-interest are kept in order by want of leisure by a succession of private cares pleasures and engagements by contentment or a sense of the ease plenty and safety which they enjoy or lastly and principally by fear foreseeing that they would bring themselves by resistance into a worse situation than their present inasmuch as the strength of government each discontented subject reflects is greater than his own and he knows not that others would join him this last consideration has often been called opinion of power this account of the principles by which mankind are retained in their obedience to civil government may suggest the following cautions one let civil governors learn hence to respect their subjects let them be admonished that the physical strength resides in the governed that this strength wants only to be felt and roused to lay prostrate the most ancient and confirmed dominion that civil authority is founded in opinion that general opinion there ought always to be treated with deference and managed with delicacy and circumspection two opinion of right which follows the custom being for the most part founded on nothing else and lending one principal support to government every innovation in the constitution or in other words in the custom of governing diminishes the stability of government hence some absurdities are to be retained and many small inconveniences endured in every country 
rather than that the usage should be violated or the course of public affairs diverted from their old and smooth channel even names are not indifferent when the multitude are to be dealt with there is a charm in sounds it was upon this principle that several statesmen of those times advised cromwell to assume the title of king together with the ancient style and insignia of royalty the minds of many they contended would be brought to acquiesce in the authority of a king who suspected the office and were offended with the administration of a protector novelty reminded them of usurpation the adversaries of this design opposed the measure from the same persuasion of the efficacy of names and forms jealous lest the veneration paid to these should add an influence to the new settlement which might ensnare the liberty of the commonwealth three government may be too secure the greatest tyrants have been those whose titles were the most unquestioned whenever therefore the opinion of right becomes too predominant and superstitious it is abated by breaking the custom thus the revolution broke the custom of succession and thereby moderated both in the prince and in the people those lofty notions of hereditary right which in the one were become a continual incentive to tyranny and dispose the other to invite servitude by undue compliances and dangerous concessions four as ignorance of union and want of communication appear among the principal preservatives of civil authority it behooves every state to keep its subjects in this want and ignorance not only by vigilance in guarding against actual confederacies and combinations but by a timely care to prevent great collections of men of any separate party of religion or of like occupation or profession or in any way connected by a participation of interest or passion from being assembled in the same vicinity a protestant establishment in this country may have little to fear from its popish subjects scattered as they are throughout the kingdom and intermixed with the protestant inhabitants which yet might think them a formidable body if they were gathered together into one country the most frequent and desperate riots are those which break out amongst men of the same profession as weavers miners sailors this circumstance makes a mutiny of soldiers more to be dreaded than any other insurrection hence also one danger of an overgrown metropolis and of those great cities and crowded districts into which the inhabitants of trading countries are commonly collected the worst effect of popular tumults consists in this that they discover to the insurgents the secret of their own strength teach them to depend upon it against a future occasion and both produce and diffuse sentiments of confidence in one another and assurances of mutual support leagues thus formed and strengthened may overawe or overset the power of any state and the danger is greater in proportion as from the propinquity of habitation and intercourse of employment the passions and counsels of a party can be circulated with ease and rapidity it is by these means and in such situations that the minds of men are so affected and prepared that the most dreadful uproars often arise from the slightest provocations when the train is laid a spark will produce the explosion chapter three the duty of submission to civil government explained the subject of this chapter is sufficiently distinguished from the subject of the last as the motives which actually produce civil obedience may be and often are very different from the reasons which make that obedience a duty in order to prove civil obedience to be a moral duty and an obligation upon the conscience it hath been usual with many political writers at the head of whom we find the venerable name of locke to state a compact between the citizen and the state as the ground and cause of the relation between them which compact binding the parties for the same general reason that private contracts do 
resolves the duty of submission to civil government into the universal obligation of fidelity in the performance of promises this compact is twofold first an express compact by the primitive founders of the state who are supposed to have convened for the declared purpose of settling the terms of their political union and a future constitution of government the whole body is supposed in the first place to have unanimously consented to be bound by the resolutions of the majority that majority in the next place to have fixed certain fundamental regulations and then to have constituted either in one person or in an assembly the rule of succession or appointment being at the same time determined a standing legislature to whom under these pre-established restrictions the government of the state was thenceforward committed and whose laws the several members of the convention were by their first undertaking thus personally engaged to obey this transaction is sometimes called the social compact and these supposed original regulations compose what are meant by the constitution the fundamental laws of the constitution and form on the one side the inherent indefeasible prerogative of the crown and on the other the inalienable imprescriptible birthright of the subject secondly a tacit or implied compact by all succeeding members of the state who by accepting its protection consent to be bound by its laws in like manner as whoever voluntarily enters into a private society is understood without any other or more explicit stipulation to promise a conformity with the rules and obedience to the government of that society as the known conditions upon which he is admitted to a participation of its privileges this account of the subject although specious and patronized by names the most respectable appears to labor under the following objections that it is founded upon a supposition false in fact and leading to dangerous conclusions no social compact similar to what is here described was ever made or entered into in reality no such original convention of the people was ever actually holden or in any country could be holden antecedent to the existence of civil government in that country it is to suppose it possible to call savages out of caves and deserts to deliberate and vote upon topics which the experience and studies and refinements of civil life alone suggest therefore no government in the universe began from this original some imitation of a social compact may have taken place as a revolution the present age has been witness to a transaction which bears the nearest resemblance to this political idea of any of which history has preserved the account or memory i refer to the establishment of the united states of north america we saw the people assembled to elect deputies for the avowed purpose of framing the constitution of a new empire we saw this deputation of the people deliberating and resolving upon a form of government erecting a permanent legislature distributing the functions of sovereignty establishing and promulgating a code of fundamental ordinances which were to be considered by succeeding generations not merely as laws and acts of the state but as the very terms and conditions of the confederation as binding not only upon the subjects and magistrates of the state but as limitations of power which were to control and regulate the future legislature yet even here much is presupposed in settling the constitution many important parts were presumed to be already settled the qualifications of the constituents who were admitted to vote in the election of members of congress as well as the mode of electing the representatives were taken from the old forms of government 
that was wanting from which every social union should set off and which alone makes the resolution of the society the act of the individual the unconstrained consent of all to be bound by the decision of the majority and yet without this previous consent the revolt and the regulations which followed it were compulsory upon dissentients but the original compact we are told is not proposed as a fact but as a fiction which furnishes a commodious explication of the mutual rights and duties of sovereigns and subjects in answer to this representation of the matter we observe that the original compact if it be not a fact is nothing can confer no actual authority upon laws or magistrates nor afford any foundation to rights which are supposed to be real and existing but the truth is that in the books and in the apprehension of those who deduce our civil rights and obligations a pactus the original convention is appealed to and treated of as a reality whenever the disciples of this system speak of the constitution of the fundamental articles of the constitution of laws being constitutional or unconstitutional of inherent inalienable inextinguishable rights either in the prince or in the people or indeed of any laws usages or civil rights as transcending the authority of the subsisting legislature or possessing a force and sanction superior to what belongs to the modern acts and edicts of the legislature they secretly refer us to what passed at the original convention they would teach us to believe that certain rules and ordinances were established by the people at the same time that they settled the charter of government and the powers as well as the form of the future legislature that this legislature consequently deriving its commission and existence from the consent and act of the primitive assembly of which indeed it is only the standing deputation continues subject in the exercise of its offices and as to the extent of its power to the rules reservations and limitations which the same assembly then made and prescribed to it as the first members of the state were bound by express stipulation to obey the government which they had erected so the succeeding inhabitants of the same country are understood to promise allegiance to the constitution and government they find established by accepting its protection claiming its privileges and acquiescing in its laws more especially by the purchase or inheritance of lands to the possession of which allegiance to the state is annexed as the very service and condition of the tenure smoothly as this train of argument proceeds little of it will endure examination the native subjects of modern states are not conscious of any stipulation with the sovereigns of ever exercising an election whether they will be bound or not by the acts of the legislature of any alternative being proposed to their choice of a promise either required or given nor do they apprehend that the validity or authority of the laws depends at all upon their recognition or consent in all stipulations whether they be expressed or implied private or public formal or constructive the party stipulating must both possess the liberty of assent and refusal and also be conscious of this liberty which cannot with truth be affirmed of the subjects of civil government as government is now or ever was actually administered this is a defect which no arguments can excuse or supply all presumptions of consent without this consciousness or in opposition to it are vain and erroneous still less is it possible to reconcile with any idea of stipulation the practice in which all european nations agree of founding allegiance upon the circumstance of nativity that is of claiming and treating as subjects all those who are born within the confines of their dominions 
although removed to any other country in their youth or infancy in this instance certainly the state does not presume a compact also if the subject be bound only by his own consent and if the voluntary abiding in the country be the proof and intimation of that consent by what arguments should we defend the right which sovereigns universally assume of prohibiting when they please the departure of their subjects out of the realm again when it is contended that the taking and holding possession of land amounts to an acknowledgment of the sovereign and a virtual promise of allegiance to his laws it is necessary to the validity of the argument to prove that the inhabitants who first composed and constituted the state collectively possessed a right to the soil of the country a right to parcel it out to whom they pleased and to annex to the donation what conditions they thought fit how came they by that right an agreement amongst themselves would not confer it that could only adjust what already belonged to them a society of men vote themselves to be the owners of a region of the world does that vote unaccompanied especially with any culture enclosure or proper act of occupation make it theirs does it entitle them to exclude others from it or to dictate the conditions upon which it shall be enjoyed yet this original collective right and ownership is the foundation for all the reasoning by which the duty of allegiance is inferred from the possession of land the theory of government which affirms the existence and the obligation of a social compact would after all merit little discussion and however groundless and unnecessary should receive no opposition from us did it not appear to lead to conclusions unfavorable to the improvement and to the peace of human society first upon the supposition that government was first erected by and that it derives all its just authority from resolutions entered into by a convention of the people it is capable of being presumed that many points were settled by that convention anterior to the establishment of the subsisting legislature and which the legislature consequently has no right to alter or interfere with these points are called the fundamentals of the constitution and as it is impossible to determine how many or what they are the suggesting of any such serves extremely to embarrass the deliberations of the legislature and affords a dangerous pretense for disputing the authority of the laws it is this sort of reasoning so far as reasoning of any kind was employed in the question that produced in this nation the doubt which so much agitated the minds of men in the reign of the second charles whether an act of parliament could of right alter or limit the succession of the crown secondly if it be by virtue of a compact that the subject owes obedience to civil government it will follow that he ought to abide by the form of government which he finds established be it ever so absurd or inconvenient he is bound by his bargain it is not permitted to any man to retreat from this engagement merely because he finds the performance disadvantageous or because he has an opportunity of entering into a better this law of contracts is universal and to call the relation between the sovereign and the subject to contract yet not to apply to it the rules or allow of the effects of a contract is an arbitrary use of names and an unsteadiness of reasoning which can teach nothing resistance to the encroachments of the supreme magistrate may be justified upon this principle recourse to the arms for the purpose of bringing about an amendment of the constitution never can no form of government contains a provision for its own dissolution and few governors will consent to the extinction or even to any abridgment of their own power it does not therefore appear how despotic governments can ever in consistency with the obligation of the subject be changed or mitigated 
despotism is the constitution of many states and whilst a despotic prince exacts from his subjects the most rigorous servitude according to this account he is only holding them to their agreement a people may vindicate by force the rights which the constitution has left them but every attempt to narrow the prerogative of the crown by new limitations and in opposition to the will of the reigning prince whatever opportunities may invite or success follow it must be condemned as an infraction of the compact between the sovereign and the subject thirdly every violation of the compact on the part of the governor releases the subject from his allegiance and dissolves the government i do not perceive how we can avoid this consequence if we found the duty of allegiance upon compact and confess any analogy between the social compact and other contracts in private contracts the violation and non-performance of the conditions by one of the parties vacates the obligation of the other now the terms and articles of the social compact being nowhere extant or expressed the rights and offices of the administrator of an empire being so many and various the imaginary and controverted line of his prerogative being so liable to be overstepped in one part or another of it the position that every such transgression amounts to a forfeiture of government and consequently authorizes the people to withdraw their obedience and provide for themselves by a new settlement would endanger the stability of every political fabric in the world and has in fact always supplied the disaffected with a topic of seditious declamation if occasions have arisen in which this plea has been resorted to with justice and success they have been occasions in which a revolution was defensible on other and plainer principles the plea itself is at all times captious and unsafe wherefore rejecting the intervention of a compact as unfounded in its principle and dangerous in the application we assign for the only ground of the subject's obligation the will of god as collected from expediency the steps by which the argument proceeds are few and direct it is the will of god that the happiness of human life be promoted this is the first step and the foundation not only of this but of every moral conclusion civil society conduces to that end this is the second proposition civil societies cannot be upholden unless in each the interest of the whole society be binding upon every part and member of it this is the third step and conducts us to the conclusion namely that so long as the interest of the whole society requires it that is so long as the established government cannot be resisted or changed without public inconveniency it is the will of god which will universally determines our duty that the established government be obeyed and no longer this principle being admitted the justice of every particular case of resistance is reduced to a computation of the quantity of the danger and grievance on the one side and the probability and expense of redressing it on the other but who shall be the judge of this we answer every man for himself in contentions between the sovereign and the subject the parties acknowledge no common arbitrator and it would be absurd to refer the decision to those whose conduct has provoked the question and whose own interest authority and fate are immediately concerned in it the danger of error and abuse is no objection to the rule of expediency because every other rule is liable to the same or greater and every rule that can be propounded upon the subject like all rules which indeed appeal to or bind the conscience must in the application depend upon private judgment it may be observed however that it ought equally to be accounted the exercise of a man's own private judgment 
whether he be determined by reasonings and conclusions of his own or submit to be directed by the advice of others provided he be free to choose his guide we proceed to point out some easy but important inferences which result from the substitution of public expediency into the place of all implied compacts promises or conventions whatsoever one it may be as much a duty at one time to resist government as it is at another to obey it to wit whenever more advantage will in our opinion accrue to the community from resistance than mischief two the lawfulness of resistance or the lawfulness of a revolt does not depend alone upon the grievance which is sustained or feared but also upon the probable expense and event of the contest they who concerted the revolution in england were justifiable in their counsels because from the apparent disposition of the nation and the strength and character of the parties engaged the measure was likely to be brought about with little mischief or bloodshed whereas it might have been a question with many friends of their country whether the injuries then endured and threatened would have authorized the renewal of a doubtful civil war three irregularity in the first foundation of a state or subsequent violence fraud or injustice in getting possession of the supreme power are not sufficient reasons for resistance after the government is once peaceably settled no subject of the british empire conceives himself engaged to vindicate the justice of the norman claim or conquest or apprehends that his duty in any manner depends upon that controversy so likewise if the house of lancaster or even the posterity of cromwell had been at this day seated upon the throne of england we should have been as little concerned to inquire how the founder of the family came there no civil contests are so futile although none have been so furious and sanguinary as those which are excited by a disputed succession Four not every invasion of the subject's rights or liberty or of the constitution not every breach of promise or of oath not every stretch of prerogative abuse of power or neglect of duty by the chief magistrate or by the whole or any branch of the legislative body justifies resistance unless these crimes draw after them public consequences of sufficient magnitude to outweigh the evils of civil disturbance nevertheless every violation of the constitution ought to be watched with jealousy and resented as such beyond what the quantity of estimable damage would require or warrant because a known and settled use of governing affords the only security against the enormities of uncontrolled dominion and because this security is weakened by every encroachment which is made without opposition or opposed without effect five no usage law or authority whatever is so binding that it need or ought to be continued when it may be changed with advantage to the community the family of the prince the order of succession the prerogative of the crown the form and parts of the legislature together with the respective powers offices duration and mutual dependency of the several parts are all only so many laws mutable like other laws whenever expediency requires either by the ordinary act of the legislature or if the occasion deserve it by the interposition of the people these points are wont to be approached with a kind of awe they are represented to the mind as principles of the constitution settled by our ancestors and being settled to be no more committed to innovation or debate as foundations never to be stirred as the terms and conditions of a social compact to which every citizen of the state has engaged his fidelity by virtue of a promise which he cannot now recall such reasons have no place in our system to us 
if there be any good reason for treating these with more deference and respect than other laws it is either the advantage of the present constitution of government which reason must be of different force in different countries or because in all countries it is of importance that the form and usage of governing be acknowledged and understood as well as by the governors as by the governed and because the seldomer it is changed the more perfectly it will be known by both sides six as all civil obligations is resolved into expediency what it may be asked is the difference between the obligation of an englishman and a frenchman or why since the obligation of both appears to be founded in the same reason is a frenchman bound in conscience to bear anything from his king which an englishman would not be bound to bear these conditions may differ but their rights according to this account should seem to be equal and yet we are accustomed to speak of the rights as well as the happiness of a free people compared with what belongs to the subjects of absolute monarchies how you will say can this comparison be explained unless we refer to a difference in the compacts by which they are respectively bound this is a fair question and an answer to it will afford a farther illustration of our principles we admit then that there are many things which a frenchman is bound in conscience as well as by coercion to endure at the hands of his prince to which an englishman would not be obliged to submit but we assert that it is for these two reasons alone first because the same act of the prince is not the same grievance where it is agreeable to the constitution as where it infringes it secondly because redress in the two cases is not equally attainable resistance cannot be attempted with equal hopes of success or with the same prospect of receiving support from others where the people are reconciled to their sufferings as where they are alarmed by innovation in this way and in no otherwise the subjects of different states possess different civil rights the duty of obedience is defined by different boundaries and the point of justifiable resistance placed at different parts of the scale of suffering all which is sufficiently intelligible without a social compact seven the interest of the whole society is binding upon every part of it no rule short of this will provide for the stability of civil government or for the peace and safety of social life wherefore as the individual members of the state are not permitted to pursue their private emoluments to the prejudice of the community so is it equally a consequence of this rule that no particular colony province town or district can justly concert measures for their separate interest which shall appear at the same time to diminish the sum of public prosperity i do not mean that it is necessary to the justice of a measure that it profit each and every part of the community for as the happiness of the whole may be increased whilst that of some parts is diminished it is possible that the conduct of one part of an empire may be detrimental to some other part and yet just provided one part gain more in happiness than the other part loses so that the common weal be augmented by the change but what i affirm is that those counsels can never be reconciled with the obligations resulting from civil union which cause the whole happiness of the society to be impaired for the convenience of a part this conclusion is applicable to the question of right between great britain and her revolted colonies had i been an american i should not have thought it enough to have had it even demonstrated that a separation from the parent state would produce effects beneficial to america my relation to that state imposed upon me a further inquiry namely whether the whole happiness of the empire was likely to be promoted by such a measure not indeed the happiness of every part that was not necessary nor to be expected but whether what great britain would lose by the separation 
was likely to be compensated to the joint stock of happiness by the advantages which america would receive from it the contested claims of sovereign states and their remote dependencies may be submitted to the adjudication of this rule with mutual safety a public advantage is measured by the advantage which each individual receives and by the number of those who receive it a public evil is compounded of the same proportions whilst therefore a colony is small or a province thinly inhabited if a competition of interests arise between the original country and their acquired dominions the former ought to be preferred because it is fit that if one must necessarily be sacrificed the less give place to the greater but when by an increase of population the interest of the provinces begins to bear a considerable proportion to the entire interest of the community it is possible that they may suffer so much by their subjection that not only theirs but the whole happiness of the empire may be obstructed by their union and the rule and the principle of the calculation being still the same the result is different and this difference begets a new situation which entitles the subordinate parts of the state to more equal terms of confederation and if these be refused to independency End of excerpt from the principles of moral and political philosophy by william paley published in seventeen eighty five